I'm a frequent uh, speaker at the various PyCons around the world. Uh, I also am author and co-author of two OpenStack related uh, books. One is regarding to the database as a service. The other one is for cloud application development. Uh, I'm also Java developer relationships. So what is the cold start? Basically, it's a time when when your interpreter spends to start your application. Basically, it's also called a warm up. So this is the moment of the time that being taken from the very beginning when you start your application at and up until that moment when the interpreter reach out your entry point. So uh, when it happens, why it happens, and why you should care about that. This is basically three questions that you should keep in mind through all this talk. So let me ask you, uh, let me answer why, uh, when it happens. So you write application, you import a bunch of libraries, and then you just press a start. It works fine on your computer uh, with lots of uh, CPU, with lots of RAM, and et cetera. But when it reaches reach out the cloud, it becomes very problematic and less trivial to, uh, to you how it runs out there. Even thought that you are aware that it's like it's the same Linux, it's the same architecture, the same pro uh, virtual CPUs, and should be totally fine with that. But it's not. So uh, why it happens? So most of developers of third-party libraries that you've been uh, that you've used to work with, they don't really care about the actual startup time. Uh, how to Figure it out. Figure out that when you look at the library, it's and, and its source code. So basically, take a look at their init files. So it's, when I worked with OpenStack, we have an extension to uh, pip8 uh, standard for the code guidelines, and there's a strict requirement: please don't ever put any lines of code in init files. So why? Because when you import a module the whole logic being executed that would be put to init file. So basically, when you do from some uh, from something, import something, in first place, you're not getting a module itself or any object. You get the, the whole execution of code that being in init file. So why should you care? Uh, so I've been developing serverless applications since 2013, even before Lambda uh, hit the Amazon. Uh, I worked at a startup called Iron IO, and we had an uh, offering for our customers, which called Iron uh, Iron F uh, Iron Worker. So our worker was an uh, event-driven system that that execute uh, any kind of code that being packaged as a container and runs it uh, upon the certain events. So starting Python 3.7, uh, developers can actually um, profile their imports. So how it works, um, you can set a specific variable, and then the interpreter will basically output you the whole list of the imports uh, with how much time it takes and how much CPU it took. Um, so you, you can actually use a QR scanner to, to see the official documentation. It's going to be a lot of those QRs through the stock. Um, so 3.7 give us a power of the whole profiling, and uh, they gave us uh, this 3.7.1 actually gave us the whole, uh, give us a chance to use the whole benefits of the import lab. So it's uh, it's uh, in you in your implementation more user friendly of import lib that was uh, implemented at. 2.5 uh, two as, as far as I can recall and being available to users, but it three, in 3.7 became a standard thing and the whole importing system within 3.7, it was re-implemented, even thought that to users it remained the same. Uh, so, but set story first. Uh, for, I've been developing an open, I've been part of open source project called Event Project. It, it's an open source offering for the serverless stack. So, uh, we uh, we committed ourselves to support the most popular programming languages for all our users, and of course Python was like the major one. It was one of the three officially announced languages at Oracle Open Code. So, um, what we had to do there, uh, we had to implement an uh, HTTP 1.1 uh, uh, server that runs on top of Unix domain socket. 
So you may think that this is a very trivial thing, very easy to do. You can use it. You can use the standard library. You can go uh, on full on the synchronous libraries. Would it be IUHTP, Sanic, and uh, the modern thing called uh, channels? You can use whatever that work for you. However, there is a, a strong limitation. Uh, the strong limitation on the certain constraints. Th since we're talking about serverless, we need to make sure that our application will start immediately. By immediately, I, immediately I mean the next thing. We need to start our application on 128 megabytes and 10% of a processor time and uh, the same amount of swap and uh, uh, kernel memory as well. So these constraints within Docker are capable to show you that your application basically sucks. It sucks because the way you've done it and the way those libraries that you've used uh, were implemented. So uh, as I told you, the first thing I ever saw that, OK, I can stick with IHTP or, or Sonic. But within those constraints, IHTP took almost 4.3 seconds to start. Uh, Sanic took 3.7 seconds to start, which is not literally acceptable. Um, and this is that's why it happens. Uh, uh, sorry. And uh, if you do a native a, uh, HTTP server on top of iOS async IO protocols interface, you can uh, drop your type and time up until 2.2 seconds. But if if you need to support a uh, keep alive connections, you're, you need to add more code, and that will eventually grow up until 2.6 seconds. That's what we've done with our custom own homegrown library called Async HTTP. So it's not a public library. I'm not advertising that here, but this is what we've done for our particular case, and it meets uh, the code, and the startup time actually meets our requirements. So what causes Python to go, interpreter to go slow? So there are a uh, couple of things on that. So there is interpreter time, there is your library time, uh, um, and uh, the, uh, the third party resources you've been talking to. But first, uh, I'm not here to blame the interpreter because the interpreter itself starts pretty fast. It even takes uh, almost 200 milliseconds to start. And the rest of the time is your code. So. Uh, Stop blaming the interpreter every time if your code is slow, no matter on the startup time or the, on the execution time, it's all your code. It's all your own fault. So yeah, and stop putting code in init file because I want to have, as, as a developer who worked with I maybe a huge amount of various libraries, I don't want to have any code in init files because I want to do an explicit imports rather than doing something implicitly. Um, also, if you ever care about what kind of things being stored in syspass, you may be aware that when your temperature stops, it populates the, in the instances of your of each model module that being involved in your code. Not only your own modules, but the rest of the modules that being imported and used in uh, in a, a standard library and third party dependencies. So this is like the simplest application you can uh, do with a Sonic, for instance. It just starts uh, a dummy. HTTP server and then do some uh, JSON uh, processing. So it, it looks pretty simple. It's like only how much, like 10 lines of code here. But here, what it, what it happens. So when, when you import Sanic, uh, you have no idea what basi basically goes behind that unless you actually go and see what kind of a code it executes in a nut, uh, in a, under its hood. So this small piece of code actually produces almost 8,000 imports. And uh, if I do a simple HTTP server, why should I get IO files when I'm not using them? Why should I get web sockets when I'm only developing an HTTP 1.1 server? And text fi uh, testing fixtures. Like in a runtime, when I do module lookup, 
why should I care about this piece of code what I'm not actually using and I would never use that unless I'm gonna explicitly ask for them. This is like something you, uh, you always have to keep in mind when you're developing a library, when you're doing things that other people will consume. And not, not every people actually in Python do machine learning, computer science. They're also like hardcore core, uh, Python core developers who actually been care about the Python performance, not just a math. So um, how to make your code faster? Well, uh, this is pretty a good question because nobody has a explicit answer to that. Just try to profile your code. Um, and most of Python developers, similar to Android developers, would say, like, if I want to speed up my code, I can throw up more CPUs and maybe an rack of RAM. So I would say, uh, please don't. This is not the way to make your code actually work faster. It's just a temporary solution unless you're uh, temporal solution until your code will cons will consume even that amount of RAM. Um, yeah, this is this is the open slide, and once again, this is how your init file is supposed to look like. Yeah. Uh, so one of the very useful things for modern Python development would be a new type of profiling, which is not being which not being used very. Spread, uh, it's, it's not being spread to various Python communities, but it's import profiles. So th there, is, uh, there are certain tools that, that actually utilize a new abilities of Python 3.7 and importing profile to basically give you an ability to see if you're facing a regression in your imports. Um, and this is like the also the other thing, keep your syspass always clean because uh, if you know there is a strict, uh, like an explicit dependency between the amount of modules you have in syspass and the lookup time, even thought that you initialize the module only once, but the lookup happens every time you do import something. Uh, yeah, it sh should remain clean. Um, Always measure the performance of your own application at the low constraints because it's always easy to say like all my all my code, all the tests are being executed and uh, my CI ended up being green on four gigabytes of RAM and maybe something like uh, maybe eight CPUs, eight core CPUs. But it's not the way you're sh actually supposed to look in your code. Just try to nail it down try to destroy it, at, uh, put, try, try to put it down your application. If we're talking about microservices, just hammer them down, put them on the load constraints, like every element, especially when you're, talk when you're talking about IO operations. Try to kill it. And this is where you can actually get the actual output and the actual uh, knowledge of where your application could break. In the, f in the future, because you have no idea, if you're talking about like uh, like online services, you have no idea at which moment of time how many users will appear at your platform and would they ever put you down. This is like something actually happened uh, not so long ago with Steam, like a gaming platform. Uh, because of the sales, they, people just appear and put their system down, like the whole thing. Um, so. If you can actually profile your uh, imports, if you can actually figure out how to uh, make them faster, uh, if you don't, if you're not aware of, uh, if you would use a certain bits of code in your application, try to uh, delay the imports until you actually would need them. Uh, this is like maybe someone would say this is this is like an anti-pattern for Python development. So we got used to, to see the code where you have imports in the header and the rest of your code just down below that. So um, I would recommend, um, yeah, the Guido would say I'm a foolish one, but I'm gonna say that. Just consider your imports as something very important to your own code. And if you don't, if you're not aware, if you're gonna use it later, just use an import lib to delay that and put your imports within other functions that will basically return you a particular object, would it be module, function, or a class. Um, so 
for our own use cases, what we had, uh, what we faced with, uh, our users being, uh, our users develop, keep developing their code, but they uh, were not aware of the problem of the cold start, and they they put lots of uh, logic onto the module level, and they had to execute, uh, and we had to execute their code uh, at the startup time. So in order to make our, co our own code faster and to, to give users an ability to start their, uh, st start their serverless code and actually uh, not run it before the actual event will appear that will trigger an action. So we actually delayed a whole import of customer's code. So uh, wh wh what we did, uh, like, for any other Python application, what we do, Python, uh, space, execute a module. But here, uh, we've developed uh, a Python, Pythonic CLI that actually consumes a path to your module. And then we import that and, and execute that only when, our, uh, when the event that's supposed to trigger this, this uh, code will appear, but not before that. This actually helped us to delay the whole thing about imports until the moment when it was needed. So uh, this is like two major things we've used to. We are used to return something and import something. But let's now consider the next thing. Um, just, uh, I'm gonna ask you a question, then if someone could answer later, like which these, uh, one of these two pieces of code, which one will work faster? Um, so, there are two things. There is a syspath that actually acts like a dictionary, and then is uh, there is an LRU cache, caching algorithm, that actually helps you to uh, keep your uh, re relevant data in a memory uh, whenever it's needed, and then refresh that when the, um, when the next period of the renovation will appear. Um, so, from uh, my own experiment that I've delivered to our users uh, and customers, uh, I've shown that LRU cache works a lot more faster than a uh, simple lookup thing. And here how his numbers are, what kind of uh, view numbers have. So you're looking at, at the uh, visualiz visualization of uh, two processes. When you do a simple imports uh, and you do LRU cache based imports, so uh, you might not see the whole difference on um, on these uh, imports, but I will. So, but here is like the raw numbers of that. Thirty-two nine percent of imports that are LRU cache ba based are work faster than simple imports. Uh, this is not something usual. What people uh, will go with. They w most of developers are not aware of the uh, what is LRU cache do and if that available in standard library, but uh, this is like the way to overcome a problem of uh, dictionaries where the lookup time is hardly dependent on the number of elements out there. Even thought that in Python 3, the dictionary was r slightly reworked, but it's still not the fastest data type in Python. Uh, so that was number the percentage, and here is a number. When you do an experiment of ten, uh, you can run the experiment ten times of ten thousand imports. You get a uh, hundred thousand um, uh, values. So from that, uh, on the each experiment, the uh, mean value of num of imports that being faster with other you against uh, simple imports is. Uh, so, so the 65-14 uh, imports were faster with LRU rather than uh, with the regular uh, syspath lookup. And uh, this is how it looks the, uh, w there, is a, there is a line, probably uh, you might not see it, it's tiny red line, which shows the one-to-one -one the one -to -one correla correlation between LRU imports and imports from this, uh, using the syspath. So all of those, Dots it goes on to, onto the right of the input of the, the that line is what you get with syspass. All of those imports are slower all the time. So um, yeah, you, you, this the whole this experiment and its conclusions are available at the GitHub. 
you can scan this and then just read the whole paper about that. Um, so this is what kind of a problems we've been facing with. Uh, until maybe 2016, people have no idea what the cold start is. Uh, probably people who've been developing Java, they want to get uh, their code run in JVM faster. Uh, we, 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 we haven't seen this problem with any compiled languages, but when, you, when we're talking about interpreted languages or a language that required to run your bytecode in certain virtual machine, it's just very revel uh, relevant to that. And also, I encourage you to take a look at certain projects like GraalVM. It's a native uh, uh, virtual machine that allows you to run various your applications uh, written in Java, Kotlin, Python, uh, Ruby, and R within the JVM. And actually helps to reduce the time that being spent to start your application uh, in various uh, operating systems and uh, environments like would it be virtual machines, would it be containers, or just a bare metal thing. Um, so uh, this is what we faced with. This is how we attempted to solve this particular problem. And import lib that was begin to be uh, begin uh, begun to be available since uh, 3.7 made us to use uh, to use that. However, our certain certain customers still use Python 2, and it's kind of problematic for them, but uh, I will tell them that if you're going serverless or you redeveloping your monolithic application to something modular, would it be um, like a pasta or lasagna architecture, uh, you should start from the very beginning. Even thought that most of the de dependencies, most of Python libraries already switched to Python 3. And of course, you probably uh, all of all of you know that there is a, an end of life for Python 2, which will start uh, January January 1st, 2020. So uh, if you haven't do this, just sw switch to Python 3.7 at the very beginning. Even thought it's not an LTS release, but it has lots of useful useful features for profiling and for imports in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? I was wondering about some con <coughs> some context. When you showed us the Python 3.7 different import class, where does that code go? Like, does it go into the interpreter, or does it go in your own code? It leads you to GitHub. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so this is the part of uh, our own uh, library that we've developed for uh, people who use FN project for uh, for serverless functions. But this is a pretty relocatable code. It just basically independent from our own offering. But uh, this is what I've personally done and I found this very useful when you're talking when you work with modules that you aren't aware of what happens inside of that what kind of imports appear there so this is kind of useful but also this this particular example expects that um, it's basically very uh, at certain point it's only related to our case because we have a certain uh, pattern for Python code, so we expect that users in their, in their entry point module will have a certain function that we are looking up here. So basically, um, okay, it's it's uh, it's in the abstraction class. We basically expect a user to expect a developer to give uh, a certain name of a function that we're gonna look for. But this is pretty s simple to adjust to whatever you do. But all of this code is based on import lab. And this is what helped us to overcome a problem of a cold start. Even thought that we had to uh, bump the version of the interpreter from 3.5.2 up to 3.7.1. And we're kind of just cutting the release until 3.7, which is going to be 
three seven two later or three seven five as, as far as I can, uh, can recall. Okay, I think that's it for the time. So maybe if you have questions, you can uh, ask him afterwards. So thank you so much again.